Good evening everybody and welcome to this evening service on Maundy Thursday. I um, just want to make you aware that there's a service happening tomorrow morning at the Old Independent at 10 o'clock um, with the churches together in Haverhill and you'll be very welcome to join them and on the march as they march to the town for the open air service. Here's some words from Psalm 35 and before I also read Psalm 35 there is tea and coffee after this service as well, an important thing to remember. As we, before we leave to share fellowship together. Here's some words from Psalm 35 as we begin our service this evening. My soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. My whole being will exclaim, Who is like you, Lord? I will give you thanks in the great congregation. Among the th throngs I will praise you. My tongue will proclaim your righteousness, your praises all day long. As we gather this evening, let's turn to God in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, by your example of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, you have taught us the greatness of true humility. And on this night, you've called us to watch in his passion. Give us the grace tonight to serve each other and to enter into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. You have revealed to us, Father, your glory in the life and words of your Son, our Saviour. Help us tonight as we learn from his word to receive his teaching and to bring to his feet the fragrance and beauty of praise of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And this we ask in his name. Amen. Hear the call to worship this evening. Come and remember the love of Jesus gathered at table with friends. We come to receive from Christ the bread of life. Come receive the tender service Christ offers each of us. We come to receive the challenge of the new commandment to love one another. Come and contemplate the many temptations of a world that would entice us, like Judas, to betray the trust of a suffering God. We come this evening to travel with Jesus on his way to the cross so that our Easter Alleluia will take on new meaning. Let us worship together and reflect upon the life of Christ that we might remember what discipleship may cost and what it may reap. We praise God with our opening hymn, number 469. Praise to the holiest in the height, number 469. Thank you.
words in mind of praise to the Lord. Let us worship God with prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Our loving Heavenly Father, you are our ever-present God, and we come before you this evening with awe and wonder, as we recall on our minds your power and wisdom, your holiness and your majesty. We marvel at your grace and love revealed to us in Christ our Saviour. And we bless you and praise you for his eternal sacrifice. We worship and adore you in his name. Our loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the creation of the universe and for the gift of life. We thank you for the ways in which you have revealed yourself to the world, but most of all, in your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. He came among us, full of grace and truth, but he was despised and rejected, and held of no account, oppressed and afflicted, led like a lamb to the slaughter. He was lifted up on the cross to draw the whole world to himself. You raised him from the dead, and we thank you for that, and he reigns in glory. Our great high priest, who has been tested as we are, and who is able to sympathise with our weaknesses. He now ever lives to make intercession for us. For all your mighty acts of grace and love, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you most of all that you've given us this night to enjoy your presence among us, to share it with those who love you, to fill with praise the holiest place and to consecrate the humblest home. You've given us this hour as a time of prayer that has been heard, as a deepening of our love for one another, as a rejoicing with you, for you enjoy our company and as a moment of challenge, commitment and change. We praise you, Heavenly Father. We worship you and we adore you. Amen. Our next hymn reflects on the words of the first hymn, especially on our prayers of praise and thanksgiving. How marvellous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvellous, how wonderful, says the chorus, is my Saviour's love for me. It's number 829. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Love me, a sinner condemned. 
and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. So he had not done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide his spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Thank you, Maureen. As we gather on this Maundy Thursday, and as we remember the commandment of our Lord to break bread and drink wine in the supper that he instituted, and as well as we ponder the accounts of the night which is to come, I want us to see, as Maureen has just read for us, that it was always part of God's plan to be that way. It was part of God's redemptive plan for creation, for the Son of God to die and make a way back to the Father. His death even brings those who are divided together. As I was reading this morning from my daily readings from Luke's Gospel, before Jesus' death, Herod and Pilate were enemies. But from reading this morning, Jesus' death caused them to be friends. God's death, Jesus' death, his crucifixion, bring people together. Because there's no higher place than the place of honour that Jesus has taken. Let me read to you. And let me take the clocks forward, if you like, to midnight. And in fact, it's just gone past midnight. And it's the early hours of Friday morning. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's asleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running. Like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying but they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with, th with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirits burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning and evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Saviour's hands to the cross. They nail my Saviour's feet to the cross and then they raise him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king and the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin is conquered. And Satan is just a laughing. It's Friday, Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard, 
and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is coming. Thank the Lord that we live this side of the cross and we know that Sunday is coming. I found that online and it was read by a black African pastor who got more excited than I did, so just imagine that I was a black African pastor getting excited. <laughs> With those words in mind, remembering that it's only Friday, but Sunday is coming, we're going to bring our prayers of intercession to God's throne of grace and George is going to come and lead us in our prayers for us. Jane Fox and her continuing treatment, for Linda Booty, for Jane Sterling, for Chris Bill, and Lord for those who are household, Sheila, Anna, Peter, and Jennifer. And if there's anyone else that's on your heart right now, in a moment of silence, bring them before the Lord, and I'll pray.
striving towards freedom, faith, and holiness. O oh God, we ask that you bestow upon us the power to resist temptation and remain faithful to you. Mm. May we be guided by your wisdom and your grace in our decisions and actions. Mm. Help us to be mindful of your presence in our lives and have the courage to stay true to our convictions. Grant us the strength and conviction to make wise choices. We pray for this church as it chooses a new minister. Lord, we bring that before you and ask your guidance and wisdom. And Lord, for the offering that's been given here today, we praise you and thank you for each and every gift. Bless the giver and the gift in your service. So Lord, please be, be pleased to hear this, these our prayers in Christ we pray. Amen. And now Jim is going to come and read for us from John's Gospel. Our second reading this evening is taken from John chapter 13. Uh, you'll find it on page 1081 in your Pew Bibles. And we're reading from the first 17 verses. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in this world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray, betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all these things under his power, and that he'd come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash, your, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, Not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. Before we try and understand what John is saying in his Gospel, we're going to sing again number 390, which focuses on those verses from John's Gospel. Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity. Number 390. and 
majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God, Lord of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty, God the invisible, love indestructible, in frailty appears. Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly, lifts our humanity to the heights of his throne. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty, Bow down and worship, for this is your God, this is your God, this is your God. Let us pray. So Lord, would you take my words and use them for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess it takes more than mere acquaintance to know somebody. Often the phrase, and I'm sure my fiancé thinks this all the time, I wonder what's going on inside his head, indicates a desire to know someone's inner thoughts. John, the writer of this gospel, knew Jesus. John had listened to his claims that he and God the Father were one. John heard him speak with all authority and power over humanity. Creation, evil and sin. He saw the miraculous signs and works that he did. Here we have tonight, narrated for us here, an event in the life of Jesus, with just hours to go before his death. As we read this passage from the Bible, we can know this Jesus too. Who he was and what he had come to do, and how we should respond. May such knowledge be ours this evening. By way of preparation, at the beginning of verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast. We are reading historical events. What we are and what we have read took place during the Jewish feast called Passover. As we study this passage together, we should note first that Jesus is the Son of God. In the opening verses, John reminds us who Jesus is. Jesus firstly knew what was going to happen to him. At the end of verse 1, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Throughout his ministry, he knew why he had come and what it was he had come to do. More than that, he knew when he was to do it. Such was his power and control 
over all that happened and all that took place. He knew when his life would end and what it would achieve. In the 12th chapter of John and verse 31, Jesus spoke in this all-knowing way. He says, now is the time for the judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. To die is why Jesus came. He knew it and he lived his life moving towards it. And we see too that the Son of God loved those who followed him. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Showing them the full extent of his love could be better translated, he loved them to the end, to the completion of what he had come to do. This love of Jesus is an everlasting love. It never fails. Let this be said to all gathered here this evening who have trusted in Jesus for their forgiveness of their sins and who have surrendered their control of their lives to him. This love we read of here is the same love that he has for you. It's an amazing love, an eternal love for all who faithfully follow the Lord. And for those of us and, 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 and those in this world who do not know Jesus as the one who forgives wrongs, and for those who haven't surrendered their lives to him, know this, Jesus loves you and loves them, them and longs for them to trust in him, to ask him for forgiveness and submit all that they are to him. Because it's for this very reason that Jesus came. Yet in this passage, it is the love for his followers that we are told about. Knowing that he was about to leave this world and return to the Father, knowing exactly what was before him, all that awaited him, what do we find burns in the heart of Jesus? It is this love for his own. This is Jesus, the Son of God. With his death before him, it is his love and concern for those around him that fills his thoughts. And we should note as well that he had the power over everything. The evening meal was being served, it says in verse 2, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus' betrayal and had been agreed with the religious rulers and the plot to kill Jesus was reaching its conclusion. The enemy's work was at a frenzy. Jesus knew this. He knew who his betrayer was and he knew that he had power over all things. He knew that there was nothing that he could not do. Think of the perfect control, the perfect love, the perfect obedience that marks the authority of Jesus. Who is in charge here? Jesus, the Son of God. And note as well that Jesus knew where he was going. He knew that the Father, in verse 3, had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knew who he was. He had come from God and was returning to God. This is the self-knowledge of Jesus. He has always been. He came from God. And he always will be. He returned to God. He is the glory of God, the place at God's side from which he came and to which he returned. Jesus was not trying to discover self-identity or wonder what one day he might become during his time on earth. He knew who he was. This then is Jesus, the Son of God. It is sure evidence that he was who he claims to be. For those of us here this evening who have trusted in him and who follow him, it's a wonderful reminder that God became flesh with all power, purpose and knowledge and walked the way of the cross. What joy that truth brings us. What wonder at Jesus, the Son of God, who willingly did what we could not do for ourselves to reconcile us back to the Father. Let us never fail to present Jesus to this world. May we never change, diminish, water down the man Jesus Christ, Son of God, become flesh. And to those who do not know Jesus, these truths present a question. How will you respond? With the facts of who he was presented before them, there remains only two options. To believe the claims 
and what he came to do. Well, you might ask, why did he come? Which brings me to my next point. We see the Jesus, the Son of God, the serving Saviour. Jesus, the Son of God, serving Saviour, served a rebellious humanity. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, in verse 4, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now you'll be grateful that I'm not going to reenact that before you this evening, as I'm sure you'll be very grateful. But Jesus here washes his disciples' feet. It was a job that even a Jewish slave could not be requested to do. That that it had not yet taken place is not surprising, for the duty was perhaps one of the most menial tasks. Jesus, the Son of God, clothes himself like that of a slave and does that which is regarded as for the lowliest of all. It shows us true humility and love, which brought Jesus, the Son of God, to this world. For Jesus said of himself that the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to give his life as a ransom for many. His whole life as God become flesh was to serve the world, who had rebelled against their Creator and followed their own ways. So how was he to serve? Well, to cleanse all who will let him. There is a deeper significance still to what Jesus does. He comes to Peter, who asks with emphatic disbelief, and I think Peter, being very bold, he says, Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? He cannot, Peter cannot understand what is happening and the implications for him of seeing Jesus washing his own feet. They're mind-blowing for him. This is not the role of the Son of God, the conquering Saviour, who will rule over the world and deal with those who oppose him. Jesus replied, You don't realise now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. The final event that would take place is the death and resurrection of Jesus. After this, says Jesus, you will understand. It will be after the accomplishment of what this foot washing signifies. Then Peter will grasp what Jesus was doing. Indeed, the Holy Spirit, who is promised to the disciples, will enable them to understand. But even with such a gentle and tender response, Peter still thinks he knows best. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Peter's reply is an emphatic one, but his statement goes further. No, says Peter, no, not in this age, or even in the age to come, will this take place, Peter pronounces. This act of Jesus has no place in his thinking, and now the one he has just called Lord, he dismisses out of hand. Such actions of Jesus will never be. Peter forbids it. And I think it, this shows, Peter's reaction shows the root of mankind's rebellion against God. We decide. We know best. God is knocked off the throne of our lives and we make the decisions. We decide what's right and wrong. The irony is that's just the root problem of rejecting God's rightful rule over our lives that Jesus has come to deal with. And Peter is unaware that this foot washing of Jesus symbolises it. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now the reply of Jesus is as startling as the indignation of Peter we have just witnessed. We begin to see the symbolism of foot washing even more. Unless Jesus washes a person, they have no part with him. Unless an individual submits to Jesus and is cleansed by him, they will never know him. The foot washing illustrates and looks forward to the cleansing work of the cross that Jesus provided for all who submit to him. The foot washing illustrates and looks forward to the cleansing work of the cross. This washing by Jesus of our rebellious actions and attitudes towards God can alone make us clean in God's sight. If we never turn to this, then God cannot accept us. For the dirt of sin is vile in the sight of a holy God. Not being with Jesus involves not only this short life, but for all of eternity, as we sung about in our, one of our opening hymns. But if we do come to Jesus in forgiveness, asking for his cleansing power, clean we shall be. And we see the serving Saviour making us completely clean forever. 
Then, Lord, said Simon Peter, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. His response reveals him to be a true follower of Jesus. Now, the thought of being apart from Jesus fills Peter with horror, and his logic runs something like, in that case, Lord, wash me completely, for the more I'm washed, the closer I'll be. It is the cry of faith. Oh, that everybody here this evening would respond to Jesus as Peter does, in an all-hoping, all-submitting response. It bows the knee to the person and work of Jesus. And is that not what we've seen in the passage this evening? The person and work of Jesus. How shall we respond? Yet this reply of Peter causes Jesus to teach more about the cleansing work that his death will achieve. Once we have come to Jesus, and asked to be clean, we are clean indeed, and clean forever. Jesus says a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean. Let us remind and encourage one another of the work of Jesus upon the cross, and what it accomplished. For all who trust in it, it is completely effective forever. When we come to Jesus, and we are made clean, clean we are, and we stay that way. Yes, we sin and we fail in following Christ, but we seek his forgiveness for the wrong things that we do. Jesus tells us that it is just like washing feet after bathing, for the whole of us is already clean. Rebellion against God is no more. We are accepted because of the cleansing work of Christ. Let us be watchful of depending upon anything else other than the work of the cross. For our standing before God depends on this alone. He continues, Jesus says, Though not every one of you, for he knew he was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Here's a reminder that there are those who are not clean. Mere ritual cleansing, taking part in a ceremony of belief, is useless if the heart of the individual is not right. Jesus would have washed Judas's feet, and yet he was not clean. It is the greatest warnings against outward religion that has not submitted to Jesus and asked him to cleanse us. Of this we must remind each other. A young lad lived that way of outward show. He went regularly to church morning and night. He would sometimes have the gumption to pray before the whole church. He would speak and act as though a faithful follower of Jesus, yet without knowing and living it in his heart. That person was me. How I needed to come humbly and pleadingly before the cross of Jesus and submit to its cleansing power. Such truth warns us clearly. So we examine ourselves. And so when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place with the foot washing complete. He now continues to use what he has done to teach them to see finally that the Son of God, Jesus is the Son of God, the serving Saviour, an example for us all. He asks, do you understand what I've done for you? It is an immensely pregnant question. This whole event now takes on one final application for all who would be a part of Jesus. He wants them to reflect on what he has done for them. This is why he questions them and why he begins to help them with the answer. We see the serving Saviour to remember your teacher and Lord. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Jesus reminds them exactly of his relationship to them. He was the one who instructed them, who revealed to them the things of the kingdom of God. Indeed, they believed that he was their entry into God's kingdom, though they knew not how. And their understanding was clouded. They trusted Jesus as Lord, a title that carried divine implications that belong to God alone. Yes, says Jesus, this is who I am. You address me rightly so. You are right in following me as such. And then we see the, the command of Jesus, the Son of God, the serving Saviour, to do as I have done for you. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example you should do. This is what Jesus has done for them, and they must do the same for others. For if Jesus, their teacher and Lord, had served, how much more should they? 
It is his example that Jesus focuses their attention on. An attitude of the heart that Jesus has modelled. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now you know all things. You will be blessed if you do them. The illustration that Jesus uses of the master to servant and sender to messenger forces home the point. The servant plays a subservient role to the master and likewise the messenger to the sender. The very roles of servant and messenger are defined by those in authority over them, the person they serve. So also with Jesus. He serves, so must we. Think of that difficult church task that no one knows you do. It is tiresome. It's laborious. Frankly, you think it's a waste of time. But now think of Jesus. Can there be any motivation for service among God's people, indeed in God's world, than the person and work of Jesus, the Son of God? Take time, brothers and sisters, to consider Jesus and the way of the cross and serve in that light and love. Hence the purpose and example of Jesus, the Son of God, the serving Saviour, become beautifully intertwined together to provide a way of cleansing, a way of being made right with God. He was willing to humble himself and serve even to death. How much more we? This is what it means to follow Jesus, for it is the way of the cross. A few decades later, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, a Christian leader would write to a church and exhort them to imitate their Lord and Saviour. The words sum up wonderfully what we have been considering this evening. They are no less applicable now than they were then, for they are the very words of God. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Amen. As we approach the Lord's table, we're going to sing number 596. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Number 596. Such love and 
and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, but Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. We come to celebrate now. Love so amazing. Hear the words of Revelation as we come to the Lord's table. Jesus says, listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. Hear words of invitation as we approach the Lord's table. Remember, this is not my invitation, but God's invitation to you this evening. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul as we come around the Lord's table. For I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let's just pause then to reflect in the Lord's presence and then I'll lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving. To remember Jesus, to keep his memory alive in our midst, and to obey his command, we celebrate the feast. Give, to give thanks to you, O God, to offer the gratitude and praise which is our duty and joy, we celebrate the feast to honour promises and our own, to open our hearts and our community to your grace, and to seek your healing, we celebrate the feast. To lift again the cup of salvation, in which is gathered all that you have done for us, and all that we share in your name, with those here and with those who have gone before us, we celebrate the feast. We praise you and we bless you. Amen. Jesus said, This is my body which is given for you, and every time you eat it, remember me. As we receive the bread, we shall retain it, and we shall eat together, because we are all one in Christ.
This is the body of Christ broken for us. Let's eat with thankful hearts. Jesus then took the cup after supper and said, This is the blood of the new covenant, signed and sealed by my blood. And every time you drink it, he asks us to remember him. Again, as we receive the cup, we we shall retain it and drink it together, because we are all one in Christ Jesus. The blood of Christ that has been shed for us, let's drink with thankful hearts. Let us pray. Your death, O Lord, we remember. Your resurrection, we confess. We await your final coming. Glory be to you, Christ who has died, Christ who has risen, Christ, who will come again. God of grace, you have called us to be your disciple people and gathered us to your table. Here we have tasted the bread of heaven and shared the new wine of your kingdom. Empower us by your spirit that we may be a gospel people, good news for all the world. For in your name we pray. Amen. So we're gathered around the Lord's table. Let's in this moment of prayer Say the Lord's Prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Matthew's Gospel tells us that when they had finished eating the supper, they sang a hymn and went to the Mount of Olives. As we go into Haverhill, after eating the supper of the Lord, our concluding hymn is number 120. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Number 120. Babe, 
entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant King. There in the garden of tears My heavy load he chose to bear His heart with sorrow was torn Yet not my will but yours he said this is our God, the Servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. Come see his hands and his feet The scars that speak of sacrifice Hands that flung stars into space To cruel nails surrendered This is our God the Servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. So let us learn how to serve And in our lives enthrone Him Each other's needs to prefer For it is Christ we're serving this is our God, the Servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. So may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us his peace this night and always. Amen. Amen. So we bless God with our worship. and We believe he's blessed us with his presence among us. As we leave this night to go into the rest of this weekend, remembering that it may only be Thursday, but Sunday's coming. Let's bless each other with the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.